now that you have mastered solving the uh, Hayes and Williams method using, or excuse me, Hardy Cross method using spreadsheets, um, now I think you're ready to apply kind of the uh, industry standard approach for solving pipe networks, and that's water gems. Um, so I'm going to email you some instructions on how to download and install water gems, and a, a couple of people in the class have already done that, and um, there have been a few bumps on the road, so hopefully we get through it. If we get started early enough, then it won't be an issue, but you know, if you wait until the day that I'm demonstrating water gems and think that you're going to install it in the 10 minutes between classes, probably it won't work. So my suggestion is as soon as you get the instructions, try and obtain the files. You're going to have to create an account with Bentley and, uh, and install it on your computer. And then that way, you know, if we get started early, then uh, there will be enough time to sort out any kind of issues that pop up along the way. Do you have multiple, like, account or multiple downloads on each account? Yeah, what they have you do is install something called Bentley Connect, and it runs in the system tray of your computer, and it's kind of the way to identify yourself on whichever machine you're using at a given time. So you could install it on a desktop at home and also on your laptop, and then just whichever machine you're using at a given time is the one that you'd log into Bentley Connect on. Okay. Um, also, homework six is uh, due a week from today, and I guess I should have written this on here. It's on the uh, course schedule, but our first exam is on Wednesday, February 22nd. <clears throat> I'll talk more about the format of that exam, but the coverage will be all of the classes that we've had from the beginning of the semester up to and including uh, the lecture on Friday of this week. Uh, Monday uh, before the exam is going to be related to the project and so Monday's class won't necessarily be included in the exam material but today and Friday of this week will. Are there any questions on the announcements? Okay, we're continuing talking about pumps today, today and last time we talked about how to find the operating point and remember that the operating point is where you put together a system curve and a pump curve and find out the flow rate that they have in common. Um, on the assignment that's just posted on Blackboard, homework six, there's a problem where instead of giving the equation for a system curve, no, excuse me, the, the pump curve, instead of giving you an equation, I give you a figure. And um, so the system curve is an equation. But what you're going to need to do is create an equation given the image that's provided so that you can solve for Q. So in other words, you're going to have to digitize this figure. And by digitize, what I mean is if you create a table on Excel where you say for a certain flow rate, what is the, uh, the head that's being added? So for, you can see, for example, I've said for a flow rate of 0, the head is 200. For a... Uh, flow rate of, I don't know why I went, okay, so um, 20 CFS, you can see the pump head is 150. My recommendation would be instead of going all the way up to 20, maybe do it in increments of like 5, 10, 15, and so on. So at 5 CFS, it's still probably pretty high. You're going to have to take a straight edge or, you know, do it electronically and find out for when you send up a vertical line and reflect it off of the curve, what is the head that you've got for a certain, uh, for a certain flow rate? So at five, it's maybe 190 feet of head. So you'll do that several different times. And um, then in this third column, you're creating a guess of what is the pump head being added based on the form of this equation. So the, y, the form of a pump equation is that there's some intercept, so 200 is the intercept, minus a coefficient times the flow rate squared. So the big unknown is what is the coefficient that you should use for a best fit between all of the data that you observe and um, 
your attempt to replicate it with digitizing the curve. So in other words, you're going to have a known pump head that you read off of the figure and then a predicted pump head based on some C value. So, you know, maybe C is 0.1, maybe C is 0.2. And so have this data based on an equation which is referring to some C value and then you're going to do a goal seek where you're trying to minimize the difference. So in other words, if your data is here, like you've got these data points, and then if you had C equals 0 0.5, then maybe the curve would look like that. That's no good. Maybe if you did C equals 0 0.25, your curve would look like that. So it's too low. So you're going to play around with what is the C value that matches up with the data. And maybe the data is more like this or something, but you're going to try and minimize the difference between the known pump head and the estimated uh, pump head based on some coefficient. So once you have that figure digitized, then you can set the pump curve equal to the system curve. So the first step really is just digitizing the data. And I've given you some instructions on the handout PDF that goes along with that assignment, but I also want to introduce it in class now. So any questions before we move on from this tip? Okay. Last time we talked about the efficiency of a pump combined with an electric motor. You saw that in the video that we watched that there can be different impeller diameters, that there can be different impeller thicknesses, that there's a wide range of factors that can affect how a pump uh, performs. And pump manufacturers have developed figures which kind of summarize the performance of a pump or series of pumps that are closely related. So you can see that this is a figure that was put together by Gould's Pump Incorporated. I have no idea if they're still in business. This figure comes from 1987, so it could go either way. But some of the things I wanted to share with you on this figure. Now, this has, similar to what we've seen before, on the horizontal axis is capacity, meaning flow rate. So if you look at the units, we've got both cubic meters per hour on the figure and then also gallons per minute. So we could use the same figure whether we want SI or traditional units. And then on the vertical axis, head is in feet on the left-hand side, or on the right-hand side, head is in terms of meters. So again, you could use this figure potentially for either sets of units. Now notice the curvature of this figure, which is similar to that video we watched where it was showing the pipe which was at first horizontal and there was a really high flow rate because there wasn't any head that the pump was working against. But as you inclined the pipe and the pump is having to work against some load and create additional pressure, then the flow rate decreases. So the shape of this curve follows that same trend that was observed and uh, demonstrated in the video of you have a cutoff head, which is the amount of head or pressure that is going to cause a flow rate of zero. But then if the pump isn't having to add that much pressure, then it can actually move the water through the system and uh, generate a positive flow rate. So as the flow rate increases, the head that it's adding to the system decreases. So that's the first trend I wanted to share with you. The other thing, though, is that for the same pump, it's going to perform differently depending on its rotational rate. So you'll notice here is 3,600 RPM. Here's 3,200 RPM, 2,800 RPM. So you could match a given pump with a motor that has um, a rotational rate of 2,800 RPM, and then those paired together, it would be generating about 280 feet of cutoff head. Whereas if you put it together with a larger motor, which is rotating faster, it, you know, at 3,200 RPM, the same pump, where we're not changing any of the internal characteristics, we're just driving the shaft faster, is now going to uh, generate about 365 feet of head instead. So rotational rate is one of the factors that affects the 
pump performance. Another thing that's interesting on this figure is these curves where you can see where it says 50, 55, 60, 63. Anybody guess what those numbers are referring to? It's just a guess, so there's no reason to be shy. Not a, no reason to be embarrassed if you don't get it right. It's efficiency. Efficiency. So a certain pump is not going to have the same efficiency across a large range of operating characteristics. And so, for example, if we have a pump that we're driving at 3200 RPM, if it is pumping a flow rate of 160 gallons per minute, then it's intersecting here, you can see the 50% efficiency. Um, it's more efficient, it's 55% efficient when it's operating at 190 gallons per minute. And it's maximum efficiency for that rotational rate of 3200 RPM its maximum efficiency is 65%, and so it's going to be most efficient at translating mechanical energy into fluid energy here at the flow rate of, it looks like, about 360 gallons per minute. So the efficiency of the pump is something that we can get off of the figure. And then one last thing I want to show you here is NPSH. And that stands for net positive suction head. And that is a uh, statistic that gives you some information about the risk of cavitation. Um, cavitation is something that can cause damage to equipment. And we're going to talk in more detail about how you can calculate the risk of cavitation. But one of the factors that you have to know about, its pump, uh, about a pump is what is the net positive suction head required? So NPSHR is what we're talking about here. It's the amount of suction head that is required by a pump to prevent cavitation. And so uh, that's something that every pump is going to be slightly different. You can get the information from the pump manufacturer and then do the calculation if uh, cavitation is at risk. Any questions about this figure before we move on and talk more about cavitation risk? Okay, so this is a kettle of boiling water. And of course, as we all know, at a sea level, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. But water doesn't boil at 100 degrees Celsius, Celsius at other altitudes. Um, for instance, at the top of Mount Everest, water boils at 69 degrees Celsius. So what do you know about Mount Everest compared to here? What are some differences between Mount Everest and sea level? Lower pressure. Lower pressure of what? You're right, lower pressure. Atmospheric. Atmosphere. Atmosphere, right. So why would water boil at a lower temperature when it has less atmospheric pressure? Hmm. That's what we should be asking ourselves. What it relates to is that when you've got water and it's open to the atmosphere, water molecules are trying to go into the vapor phase to some extent. There's something called a vapor, fresh, uh, vapor pressure, P sub V, um, which is related to the kinetic energy of the water molecules that are in the water and whether they have enough energy, a certain fraction of the particles will have enough energy to go from a liquid to a gas. And the atmosphere is pushing back at any given time. And so when you are heating up water, you increase the vapor pressure up to the point when the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure, the water begins to boil. And by the way, um, like the little bubbles that we see in the water here, those aren't air bubbles. It's not like that's 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, 1% carbon dioxide. It's not air. That is water vapor. So it's H2O. So what's happening when you heat the water 
is you're increasing the vapor pressure until the point at which the average kinetic energy of the particles in the water is enough that it can start going into the gas phase. So vapor pressure is this property of the pressure at which a liquid will boil. And it varies as a function of temperature. Vapor pressure goes up when temperature increases. Yes, you won't find this in the notes. This was a late addition. Uh, after our class on Monday, when I got a few blank stares when we were talking about cavitation, I thought I probably needed to add some additional information about like where cavitation comes <clears throat> from. So cavitation at its source is a phenomena that's related to vapor pressure. So vapor pressure, every, every liquid has a different vapor pressure. For example, alcohol, you probably already know alcohol evaporates more quickly than water at a given temperature. So the vapor pressure of alcohol, alcohol is higher than water. Or oil has a lower vapor pressure than water. So every liquid has a different vapor pressure at a given temperature. But for a given liquid, as temperature goes up, so does the vapor pressure. So here is some data for water. And Probably if you remember back to chemistry class, you remember there's some special significance about 760 millimeters of mercury. You know, that's atmospheric pressure, 760 millimeters of mercury. So they defined the temperature scale of 100 degrees Celsius as the boiling point of water. Like they said, by definition, 100 is the temperature that water boils at. And it just so happens that when water is at that temperature, it's exerting a pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury. The, the liquid molecules are trying to escape from the liquid phase into the vapor phase, and it has an equal pressure to atmospheric. So here we can graph it. It's not linear. The vapor pressure of water is nonlinear. So how does this matter about cavitation? We're talking about pumps, right? And how, how does pumps and boiling water relate? Um, do you remember at all in the fluid mechanics lab, one of the labs that you worked on was the Bernoulli's lab. And I think you looked at a Venturi where water was flowing pretty slowly at a low velocity, and then it went through a throat that was narrower, and it had high <coughs> velocity. Do you remember that lab that I'm talking about where it had the little tubes coming up, and you maybe traced with a pencil the shape of the, uh, the piezometric pressure at different points? What do you remember about the pressure at the throat compared to the pressure before the pipe contracted? How did the pressure change when the velocity went up through that throat? Pressure was lower. Pressure was lower. Right. So high velocity, low pressure. Low velocity, higher pressure. If Dr. Yoon had really let you crank that thing, like really just put lots and lots of water through that venturi, what you'd find is that there's a certain velocity that's so high that it causes a really low pressure of the water. And in fact, if the pressure in the throat of a venturi gets low enough, then you can start to see little vapor bubbles form. Cavitation can form. And the critical threshold is if the pressure in this throat gets below the vapor pressure, then that's when cavitation forms. So for example, when you were in the lab, it was probably about 20 degrees Celsius. So the water was about 20 degrees Celsius. So this pressure that it's talking about here is the pressure, absolute pressure, not gauge pressure. But you know, in the lab, it's probably 100 kilopascals, or you know, about 750 millimeters of mercury in the in the lab. So um, if the uh, if the absolute pressure of the water in the venturi got below the vapor pressure, then it would begin to boil. Not because it's hot, but because the, uh, 
the atmospheric pressure that's resisting the vapor pressure is equal. So you can get water to boil by raising the temperature, or you can get water to boil by reducing the pressure. Either one will cause the same effect. Frankly, I don't remember what this video is, but I'm intrigued. Let's take a look. Oh, you got to watch the commercial first, though. Grammarly. Did you know Grammarly is free for Marshall students? Yeah. Who needs Grammarly, though, when you've got ChatGPT, right? So, all right. So this, um, this demo is basically just showing that uh, you can get water to boil either by heating it up or what this person is doing is vacuuming out all of the water in a glass bell. And so, you, I'm sorry, not vacuuming out the water, vacuuming out the air. And so by sucking all of the air out, the water is cavitating. So you see all these little vapor bubbles that are forming here? That's because, uh, and then he's making the point that it's not cooked, even though the water was boiling. You know, to cook the noodles, the water would need to be warm. But all that was happening was that some of the water was going into the void above the container because the pressure of the atmosphere surrounding the water was lower than the vapor pressure of the liquid. Okay, so now we've talked a little bit about vapor pressure and uh, here's just another look of the data, this time in terms of newtons per meter squared, which is more useful to us. That's usually the units that we're working with in pressure traditionally uh, in the SI units. Yes? Speaking of tables, you had mentioned that there was a table error in the textbook. Yeah. You have to remember what that is. Yeah, let's go back to that because I think I mentioned it in one of the slides here. It was related to the uh, bulk modulus of elasticity for water. And so the, the error in that table 2.3 is that they say it's the bulk modulus divided by 10 to the 9th, but really it's this number times 10 to the 9th is what gives you the bulk modulus. So I think what I was looking for in that assignment where you had to look up the book modulus is, you know, the pressure of the water is just at the standard range, 20 degrees Celsius. So I was hoping that you'd use the bulk modulus of 2.07 times 10 to the ninth. So that's the, uh, the figure that's wrong in our book. Okay, so let's talk about cavitation. Now we all recognize that low pressure can cause boiling. So there's lots of ways that you can experience low pressure. You can experience low pressure by getting a vacuum pump and sucking all of the air out of a system. That causes low pressure. Or the Venturi that we're talking about where you have a contracting pipe section. Uh, sometimes they see low pressure. Did I, did I show you some pictures of a dam in California that was all broken up? Yeah. OK. They had low pressure at the uh, bottom of the spillway because the water, as it went down that spillway, the velocity got really high as the water is going down that spillway. And so there was a section of water in contact with the uh, spillway that had a high velocity and therefore low pressure. Another place that you can have low pressure is in the suction side of a pump because the water uh, has a pressure of zero at the interface of the atmosphere and the water. So at this location right here, it's just zero gauge. Now pressure is increasing when you go down. Then when you go into the pipe, the pressure is decreasing in the direction of flow. So the pressure is getting lower and lower and lower. And so what potentially can happen is that if this suction side pipe is long enough, or if there's a uh, big vertical deflection, like if the water level is really low and you're having to, to lift the water before it goes into the pump, then you can have a location of really low pressure where cavitation could form um, on the impeller blades. Because remember, high velocity, low pressure, you've got a high velocity uh, moving blade inside of the pump and because it's moving at a high velocity 
it on the downstream, on the uh, suction side of the impeller, the pressure is very low. Now, on the pressure side, once the water gets through the pump, the pressure is high again. But if any bubbles form uh, on, the down, on the suction side of the pump, then the bubbles, once they get to the pressure side of the pump, will collapse and send little shock waves through the, uh, through the pump. And it can cause damage pitting to the pump and uh, to the impeller blades. And like if the blades get eroded and it's imbalanced, it can start to vibrate and there have been big industrial accidents. There was a notable one in Russia in, I think, 2006. They had a big hydroelectric facility that basically exploded because one of the impellers that was at this hydroelectric facility that was supposed to be generating electricity, there was some cavitation that occurred. It got out of balance, and it just started to wobble until basically the entire building that this uh, impeller was in it got completely destroyed. So cavitation usually doesn't have huge acute consequences like that where it, you know, it all comes together with a bang. Usually it's just a gradual erosion and breakdown of your equipment. But we try and avoid cavitation for that reason, just because of the damage it can do. Um, it can cause localized pressures of up to 800 megapascals, which is really high. So this is showing some of the pitting and the damage. It's not chemical attack that's caused this. Uh, it's just that these little vapor bubbles were formed and collapsed on the impeller blade. Okay, so to prevent all of that, we have to know about the difference between how much pump head is required by the pump and how much net positive suction head is available in the system. And so you can calculate the available uh, net positive suction head by starting with the atmospheric pressure divided by the unit weight of water. So P naught is just the pressure of the atmosphere at whatever your location is. And by the way, all of these calculations are done in absolute pressure. You know, oftentimes we'll do our calculations in gauge pressure, but um, Cavitation calculations are done in absolute terms because that's what we have for vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is on the absolute pressure scale. So we want to know the absolute atmospheric pressure. Then you'd subtract out the elevation head difference between the, the water elevation and the location of the pump. So Z sub S would simply be the distance between the water and the pump. So you know, what, how far apart, how far does the water have to be lifted vertically up is the delta Zs. Now H sub L on the suction side is the cumulative friction and local losses, but only on the suction side of the pump because it doesn't matter what's going on upstream uh, you know, after the pump. It only matters what happens between uh, where the water is getting started and the pump. So it's just the suction side. And then you also subtract out the vapor pressure of the water. So that will tell you how much is available. And then what you do is compare it to the required net positive suction head. And if the available is greater than what's required, then there won't be cavitation. Um, but the required suction head increases with increasing flow rate. So if we go back to this figure, you'll notice that a certain pump is going to require only this one, 8 feet of suction head is required when it's operating at a flow rate of 225 gallons per minute. But when it's operating at 550 gallons per minute, it needs 30 feet of suction head. So the question is, is there that much suction head that's available? Because if not, it's going to cavitate. So the risk of cavitation increases the faster the pump is operating. As you put more water through the pump at a higher flow rate, then the velocities, the liquid velocities in the pump are higher, and therefore the pressure on the suction side of the pump is lower.
And then the decision criteria of whether you're at risk of cavitation is if, if the net positive suction head required is greater than what's available, then cavitation occurs. And then the flip side of that is if what's available exceeds what is required, then cavitation will not occur. There is this phrase called incipient cavitation. And it means that you're just right on the verge. So when the two are equal, then that's a limit that sometimes is calculated. Is For example, you could be looking at a physical situation and you could say how far the liquid level can fall on the suction side before there's a risk of cavitation. Or you could say what's the maximum length of the suction head pipe that's going to cause a certain amount of head loss that could cause cavitation. So when you're doing that kind of analysis, what you do is you'll set the required suction head equal to the right-hand side of this equation and then solve either for you know, the delta Z or the unknown head loss quantity or sometimes even you're calculating what's the vapor pressure that's going to cause um, cavitation. So if you, if you look, all of these three terms after the um, atmospheric are subtracted. So a big delta Z gets you closer to cavitation. More head loss gets you closer to cavitation. And then a larger vapor pressure gets you closer to cavitation. And so remember what we've learned about temperature. What's more risky for cavitation, warm water or cold water? Warm, warm water, that's right. And it's more risky for cavitation because the vapor pressure is higher for warm water. And therefore, this last term is going to take away from the atmospheric term more strongly if the vapor pressure is high. OK, so I'm showing you a system here. We've got a system where we are pumping water from a lower reservoir to an upper reservoir. And the only dimensioning that we're given is the one that we need, you know, the <coughs> dimension that there's 4.3 meters of elevation difference between the water on the suction side and the physical pump itself. We don't need to know what's the overall delta Z. We just need to know the delta Z on the suction side, so between the pump and where the water's coming from. And let's just say that we've, from the flow rate that is known, we calculated the head loss in terms of, you know, keeping track of both the local and the friction losses and combined it's 1.6 meters. And then if we look at the fluid properties, let's say this is 40 degrees Celsius water with a certain vapor pressure and a certain unit weight of water at that temperature. And then for this example, let's assume that the water, this is at sea level and so the water um, is working against an atmospheric pressure of 101,000 325 pascals. So P naught is 101.325 pascals. So what I'd like you to calculate is will cavitation occur? So remember what you're going to have to do is first calculate NPSHA and then compare to NPSH. R. So available we get from the system, required we got from the pump manufacturer. So the required suction head for this pump is 3.5 meters, but what's available is 3.76 meters. So if we start with the atmospheric pressure and divide it by the fluid's unit weight, and then subtract out the elevation difference on the suction side, the head losses only on the suction side, and the effect of the vapor pressure, we're still the available is above what's required, and so it's not going to cavitate. Okay. Now, in a real-world situation, 
How would this be? How would this kind of problem be different? Well, you wouldn't just be given the head loss, of course. That's something that you'd have to calculate. And you wouldn't just be given the required NPSH. That's something that you'd have to look up off of the table. Um, and then the other thing that you should ask in a situation like this is, so how far away are we from cavitating? We're pretty close, actually. We, our available amount is 3.76 meters, and the required is 3.5. So how much further can the water level fall in the source tank before cavitation occurs? Another 0.2 meters. So if the water level falls more than like about a foot, then cavitation is going to start in the pump. So this is actually kind of a risky situation. So how could we reduce the risk of cavitation? Well, uh, it's mostly here the delta Z. So what we could do is we could lower the pump. You see how there's this big vertical height and then <coughs> it starts flowing horizontally? All we'd need to do is just lower the pump down to the water level and that would eliminate a lot of that risk for cavitation. So that would be one thing that could be done is just lowering the pump. And of course, the pump, uh, like the pressure side is going to have to be longer, but we're not worried about cavitation on the pressure side. It only sets up on the suction side. So the number one thing you can do is lower the pump. The other thing is that you could increase the diameter of the suction uh, tube. So the pipe that's drawing the water into the pump, if you reduce the, di if you make the diameter bigger, then there's going to be less head loss. So you could reduce the head loss, you could reduce the delta Z, or I guess we could cool off the water, but that's probably going to have the uh, relatively minor effect. It would be not practical to cool off the water as a way of preventing cavitation. The number one thing would just be to make sure that the pump isn't so high to try and lower it. Any questions before we move on? Okay, so let's get some more experience with pump operations and finding the operating point. Let's say that, boy, this, is, this slide's a mess. There's just so many equations on here. Okay, let's say that we're given a pump curve and um, to make things simple, to, to make the, uh, the system curve. So here's the general form of the system curve. You're given the F, the pipe length, we know the diameter, the delta Z you can see is 12 feet. There's uh, just one K, so a K value of one. So use the data from the figure and what's given here to set up the system curve and then set it equal to the pump curve. And uh, let me write the steps on the board here first. We're going to find the operating point. So solve for Q, set system curve equal to uh, pump curve, solve for Q. And then it's asking, how long will it take to pump one metric ton of water? Uh, does anybody know what one metric ton is? 2,000 turner pounds. No. A, um, a, a, a ton for like traditional units is 2,000 pounds. It's 1,000 kilograms in uh, 1,000 kilograms. And so, you know, one metric ton is 1,000 kilograms. So, in other words, what we're saying is 1,000 liters. So we want to find out, basically, solving for the flow rate, how at that flow rate, how long would it take to pump 1,000 liters? And then we'll take efficiency into account. If the pump is 80% efficient and the motor is 65% efficient, we're going to need to calculate an overall efficiency and then put it into the power equation. So I guess we're going to solve for the overall efficiency and then put into the power equation. All right, 
right, so first things first, you need to, you're given the pump curve, and so create the system curve with the, uh, the length of 135 meters, the F value that's given, the diameter that's given. I guess just to uh, save you a bit of time, I'll tell you the cross-sectional area of the pipe here. The area of the pipe is 0 0.04909 square meters. All right, so I'll pause while you start on those calculations. I'm afraid that probably you're not going to be able to get through all those calculations. So let me just show you a little bit about where things are headed. And um, so we're given a pump curve. And we need to create a system curve. Now, it looks like when I created this example, I was making a little bit fussy by including the velocity head at location two. So if you apply just this formula, you're not going to add the velocity head at location two. It's not going to change much. Um, the equation that I came up with for the system curve is 12, which is the elevation difference, plus 282.1 Q squared. And I think it would just be 281 um, if you neglect the velocity head. It, well, it, it would be a bit lower if you neglect the velocity head, but that's a relatively minor part of it. Um, so when you, overall structure of the uh, solution is that you set the pump curve and the system curve equal to each other and you find the operating point, so a certain flow rate, so here, for a flow rate of 0.144 cubic meters per second, then I've calculated how much uh, pump head is being added. So it's adding 17.85 meters of head to the system. And then as to how long it would take to pump a cubic meter, that would be around seven seconds, so 6.9 seconds. Then the last thing that I took into account is the overall system efficiency of 52% is what's going to go in the denominator of the power equation, which has the flow rate, the unit weight of the water, and the pump head. So that's all I've got for you today. I apologize that we had to rush through that example, but we'll take another look at this uh, on Friday just in case there's any questions.